Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIE Railway Chapters webinar um, entitled Artificial Intelligence in Engineering, the Design, Understanding and Applications. Before we start, I'd just like to write, read a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection, and this will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this presentation will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SIE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to introduce you now to our host for the evening. Mr. Zolani Swane, he's the secretary of the SIE Railway Chapter. Uh, Zolani obtained a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, <laughs> uh, and is currently enrolled for a master's degree in engineering management at the University of Pretoria. He has over five years of experience working as an engineer in Transnet's research and development space. He is currently serving, as I mentioned, the secretary of the SIE Railway Chapter. I hand you over now to Zolani. means for the intro um welcome all um please uh, join me in uh, also welcoming uh, our presenter mr maumela um, mr maumela uh, is a phd candidate at the university of johannesburg in um, artificial intelligence um just a brief intro on mr maumela he obtained a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering and a master's um, a degree in electrical and electronics engineering from the University of Johannesburg in 2011 and 2013, respectively. He has also received a master's degree uh, uh, in arts in, uh, in economics uh, from the University of Waseda in uh, Tokyo in 2017, and is currently enrolled for a PhD um, specializing in artificial intelligence at the University of Johannesburg, as I mentioned earlier. He has nine years of working experience, um, as I mentioned, learning engineer at uh, Transnet Engineering. Um, I would like now to hand over to Mr. Maumela to proceed um, and take us through the presentation. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Ms. Um, so as the title says, uh, I will be taking you guys through um, uh, AI and what AI really is and how AI is being applied in different spaces within the engineering space. Um, and also we'll talk more about some other algorithms that we are actually managed to develop um, in, in, recent, in recent times. So before I start uh, on getting to the artificial intelligence, uh, I would just like to ask for, for us to reflect on uh, some of the importance of how uh, uh, the nature has been able to inspire us within the engineering space. Um, few of us here might know, and especially this is even more fitting because this is uh, in a railway, in a railway uh, chapter. Uh, the kingfish bed inspired the, the, the design of the Shinkansen, the Japanese bullet train. Um, in how it was able to catch the fish. So the, what the lead designer was able to observe and realize that the shape that the, the fish has in its mouth is enables it to be able to pierce through, um, uh, through, through a high pressure of air. And then through that kind of design, then they were able to see how they can uh, uh, design a, a, locomo a locomotive that could actually run in a, bit, in a faster speed. So when we look at this, we then realize that um, in engineering, it's been a case that uh, uh, we've been more inspired by nature. Um, the only difference being that back then it was more 
uh, inspired from the physical capabilities of nature. Whereas now we're looking at AI, AI then looks at how the internal reasoning system of nature actually works. In some of the times we might not see that there's the nature reasoning, but it is actually there. And then that's what we try to emulate uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence. So one may ask, what is machine learning? Um, myself, I usually go on and say, uh, machine learning is mainly on, um, about how do we teach machines to be able to identify things the same way that we are able to identify them uh, using the same reasoning, the same intelligence that I was talking about. So basically, how do we go on and make uh, a machine to be able to identify that um, this year is a chair, that this year uh, uh, that this year is a sofa, and then we're looking at this, this is a bed, and it can be used for this particular functionality. Uh, the, this can be used for storage, and this can be used for storage, and this can be used for storage, because these are some of the things that we have learned as human beings as we grow older, as we learn about them, and as they get to do. So learning about such things, as, such as the functionalities, that's what you're trying to make the artificial intelligence, uh, uh, with artificial intelligence, you're trying to make the computer to be able to learn. And one of the uh, 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 ways to make sure that the computer are able to learn that is through uh, machine machine learning. So in order for the for these computers to learn, what we have is we have um, uh, three main different ways in which they learn. Um, the same way as we as as happens with us as human beings as we learn things in real life, right? So we have a supervised learning where you have a teacher who's standing there showing you what the what, what you supposed to uh, what the answer is supposed to be, and when you get the answer wrong, they correct you and then they tell you how many marks you've gotten, and then they take you you, you go back to revise, and and the teacher is satisfied when you now can pass with very really good marks. Um, and then what they do then is that they teach you with the certain materials that they're giving in classroom, and then they give you the tests of things that you've never seen before. Because you can, we can all appreciate that if they give us the test on things that they've seen before, then uh, um, on on the things that we've seen, we, they taught us with in class, then it means that we, we even if we get 100%, it could be because we've cared. And then that's where in this supervised learning issue, how it actually learns. So you learn on the on on some on some material which is a syllabus which they create, and then you have the test to which they go on and test you with. Um, then unsupervised learning is what we normally do when we grow older. So because when we grow older, this is what we 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 end up learning on our own. So you end up just playing around with something, and then you find a way of saying, "Oh, okay." So since I'm looking at this at this thing, I've never seen it before, but because of these similarities that it has, or because of these differences that it has, then I cannot put it into this bucket, or I can put it into this bucket. Um, when you see certain chairs, when you start start seeing uh, office chairs when you were growing up, you could then see that, oh, okay, so the functionality is for you to be seated on. So it means that I can classify it under the chair brackets, and that's what the unsupervised learning is all about. Uh, whereas reinforcement learning is more about the carrot and stick method, where you then have uh, 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 a reward system and saying, if you are able to do this, you get, we give you this. Um, we can look at this as an example of how you can be try to encourage a kid to walk when to walk towards you. Uh, you dangle the sweet in front of them to come get the sweet. Uh, if they're crawling, you don't give them the sweet, but if they walk to you, you give them the sweet. And that is what reinforcement learning is all about. And that is how it's actually be, it's actually applied in more, in many cases. So if we were to look at these things, for example, as we, as I was indicating on the, on the aspects of machine learning, um, what we then realize is that we can we can classify the different machine learning uh, uh, things according to uh, the functionalities that they have. Um, so if one says, uh, please ca classify these objects for me on based on the city on uh, uh, how it's used for city, one will actually go on and say, oh, okay. So one of the things that I need to look for here is the area in which um, a person's a, 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 a person can actually sit sit on. Um, then you 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 then try to to identify that uh, um, that area in terms of some dimensions you go on and put in the dimensions and say okay so this one has this particular area and this one has this much amount of area um, and then you know that if you just use the area alone it won't be enough because this one also has an area on the top view so you then say i'm also interested in the height um so i'm, I'm putting the height as well so that now I can be able to distinguish be, between which one is used for storage, because now when you go for the one that's used for the storage, you're going to look and say, 
um, what space does it have a hollow space inside? Okay, if it has a hollow space inside and it has this much area on it um, and it's of this shape, then I can use it for storage. Um, oh, I see that this one is well, it's like that, so I can use this one for storage. Uh, aesthetics. Uh, for aesthetics, for this, for in a simple case in this example, you then go on and say anything that does not fit into this criteria then you consider it to be an aesthetics. That means you're talking about your plants, you're talking about your lamps, you're talking about your, your, your picture frames. So you then you what you're doing then is the same way that you've learned how you can go classify all these different objects. You are now going to teach the machine on how to identify all these different objects by looking at these different features. So this length, the width, the areas and, uh, um, and the likes, we call them features. So the process that I discussed, that I discussed earlier where you're looking at um, the length, the height, on measuring all these things. This is what we call the feature engineering part of machine learning. So myself, I usually uh, um, classify uh, um, artificial intelligence into six different application areas, uh, of which there's knowledge-based. Uh, the knowledge-based systems, I'll explain them further. Uh, there's regression, there's inference engine, there's ecosystem modeling, there's automation, there's resource management. So how I, and one thing that you should note in this one is that um, they are very blurry. There's blurry lines between each and the each and every single one of them, the gap that is in between them on the, on the graphics. Um, but what this means is that, so on the under knowledge discovery, we are looking at things such as uh, um, the applications such as your data mining. So in situations where you want to understand what is, the, what is the current state of my system right now, because you don't understand how your system is actually operating. So you're not, you need to understand what is my SE state. Um, in other cases, you have the expert knowledge, uh, which the experts have told you that, okay, so this is how the system works. This is basically the rules, the rule-based system. And then now you want to also put some intelligence into that. So this part forms under, your knowledge base. Uh, some of the applications in this area uh, are mainly around trying to find different patterns uh, from the data that you have. Um, this could be a situation where you're trying to do the condition monitoring because you say, I do not understand uh, uh, what could be causing a problem in this uh, in this locomotive failing, in this wagon failing, um, in this uh, uh, railway network failing, um, in my telecommunication system failing. So now you have these uh, knowledge base systems to say, extract that pattern, those patterns for me and tell me what exactly it is that is happening within my system. Um, so here basically in the knowledge-based system is the situation where you normally have certain classes uh, that you know already that you're going, to, you look, you're going to look towards. You already have an idea that these are the things that I'm looking for in that particular space. Uh, and also in that, in some other cases is where you just do your cluster analysis because you don't know as yet how how many groupings, how many uh, um, uh, segments are you going to have, but you have an idea of the number. Um, however, on the other case, you have a case of um, you you are trying to predict what will happen in the future. Um, you are trying to predict as well uh, uh, things which are more on a linear on a, on a linear. Yeah, a basis. You try to predict how much uh, um, how, how much load should you load your your your, your wagons with? Uh, how much load in the in the next future must you have? Uh, 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 how many number of wagons should we have in your future? In the future, how how you should go about that? So you do this through uh, the forecast planning, and this is where the regression part comes in. And then it is through this as well where you are able to monitor things in a sequential manner where you can actually have uh, uh, systems that are monitoring if there's any uh, um, uh, uh, irregularities that are occurring in your system, if there's any novelties, if there's any anomalies. So the regression system is the ones that can actually help you into, into being able to identify that. Um, and you will appreciate in many cases that these two parts here might actually even overlap in many cases. As, we, as I indicated, there's a blurry line between all these different things. Uh, resource management. Um, uh, in a in a nutshell, this is where you are planning. This is your 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 optimization problems. Uh, this is where now you're doing you 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 saying uh, I want to be able to uh, to schedule my my fleet for maintenance. Uh, but given these different constraints, how do I manage to plan when should I take which part which class which uh, uh, locomotive class uh, to to maintenance? Given that 
we have this much space available and also you realize you then remember that oh, okay in my i have a constraint of my supply chain which is this much i have a supply of the people who are working this these are the number of people who will be on leave on that day so that is a constraint so how must i go plan this thing and um the the trains train scheduling as well for example um if you want to take your 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 your, your trains to 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 sardana from uh, um uh, from Kartu, uh, but what about the the other ones coming from uh, uh, from Belleville? What do you, how do you do that? What about the ones coming from British Bay? How do you plan that you actually get this moving in an optimal manner, given whatever objective function that you're trying to achieve at the end? Um, the inference engines. This is where now we're looking more on the reasoning. So this is where rationality actually comes into into play because this is a situation where. Uh, us as human beings, for example, we make decision in uh, an uncertain environment. We make decision on about 50% of the information that is available and the other information we try to interpolate. So this is where now you're saying, how do we then make sure that we get the optimal decision making process within the machine learning space? How do we make decision when there's missing value, when we have lots of uncertainties and ambigu ambiguities? Um, this is where, for example, you're now looking at the fuzzy nature of the problem. Um, then you have ecosystem modeling. Uh, so ecosystem modeling is where now you're looking at things like your, 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 your the, uh, what, what they call the multi-agent systems, where you have different systems that are operating with different intelligence within your environment. Um, and these systems communicate with each other because now you have, your, your, your environment has become so complex, you do not understand it anymore. If one had to ask uh, um, uh, you to say, can you tell me about the railway industry uh, uh, in South Africa? It's too complex for you to actually go on and know everything that is happening because you have to now, now talk about the HR component of it. You must talk about the procurement component of it. You must talk about the contract management of it. You must talk about the maintenance component of it. So it has become very complex, hence in many organizations, there's many departments. So ecosystem modeling just basically means that you have a representative agent that is representing all the different departments of your car organization so much to a point when um when your condition monitoring tells you that you need to replace uh, uh you need to replace the a certain wheel you have a condition you have another agent that is on improvement which knows already that it must already be planning on making uh, uh, a purchase of uh, uh uh putting in a purchase order while it's making a purchase order, it notifies the one who does the maintenance that you need to be clearing up the space because there's a there's a there's a wagon that is coming to be changed into some into something uh, uh, to be changed and replaced. The, the components to be replaced. Then you also have uh, automation. So automation, um, uh, uh, you can think about it as autonomous uh, the autonomous vehicles, for example, um, uh, the autonomous uh, uh, flying uh, uh, drones which are flying on their own. The train locomotives, for example, which are which are, don't have the drivers, we're using the autopilot systems. But uh, the focus of today, we want to try to uh, dig deeper into more on the resource management, um, uh, which is where where we're going to talk more about the optimization techniques. Um, so on these optimization techniques, um, it depends on how you frame the question. So in other situation, here someone can say. Um, you framing the question to say uh, you do, you want a situation where you will not have you will not be tired the following day. Um, so how do you make sure that the following day you are more you are, you are, you are, you are more you are more relaxed? How do you how do you rest today to actually make sure that that becomes the case and that is your problem which you need to optimize. So then what what means is that you need to say how do you then make sure you the person goes and sleep in the most a uh, place that is more ideal to maximize the amount of uh, relaxation that they will actually have. Another question someone can come and say, okay, but you have all these furnitures, but we want to make sure that every one of them is being used uh, optimally. So you have all these resources. How do you optimally use these resources? Then you want to allocate these resources to the different users so that they may use them in an opt more, uh, optimal manner. So it again comes back to how you frame the question and how you want to, uh, to, to, what problem are you trying to solve? You can have a situation where you have many problems that you're trying to solve. So that means that you have more objectives that you're trying to solve. And that is what we call the multi-objective uh, um, uh, problem. And in a multi-objective problem, uh, you, you might actually even have a case where 
all your objectives are contradictory to each other. And that's where now you must try to find the balance, the Pareto efficiency part of saying, okay, so if I'm operating within this space, at least I'm in the space where none of my other players are getting worse than what the other ones are getting. So that's one way in which you can look, and look at that. Um, so uh, optimization on its own has been used a lot within um, the, the, the machine learning space. Uh, where when you're talking about supervised, supervised learning is uh, uh, algorithms on their own as well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to minimize uh, the error between what you're estimating and the true value. Uh, so you can use this optimization techniques to actually go on and uh, uh, optimize that and minimize that particular error that you have. Um, the same thing happens with unsupervised learning where you are trying to, for, for example, you're trying to find um, a, a, a point which when you put it you in, amongst your data set it can might it minimizes the distance between the different data points that you have within it uh, another part is we use it as well to try to look for the hyperparameters of the different machine learning algorithms so in the next part what we're going to discuss we're going to discuss um, the different optimization techniques and we'll take you through uh, the one that we developed um, which is based on Ubuntu uh, philosophies. We call this algorithm Olimisana optimization algorithm. We'll try to discuss it in a bit more details. But first, before I get there, uh, it will be important to discuss the other population-based uh, meta heuristic algorithms that are out there. Uh, so they differ from the other algorithms in the sense that um, here we look for, we have a population of uh, um, uh, uh, what we call the agents, which are trying to solve the same problem. And then when you're solving those problems, you always try to find out where is the best and who's the, uh, and what, when, was the, when was my best uh, uh, position in all this time and what was the best position of any other individual within the, the, uh, um, my, my, my search space. I uh, will show that how that actually works in a, in a thing, uh, uh, later. So basically what the problem it has to try to do is, uh, in many cases, most of the models, uh, uh, most of the optimization algorithms can get stuck here in the local minima, um, whereas what you need looking for is you're looking for this global optimal space. So what you have in, in meta heuristic in the population-based ones is that you have these agents being placed in all these different places here. So you can have, let's say if you have 20 agents, so you, may, you might have one which is placed in each and every one of the positions for the X, uh, uh, um, X variable. So it means that if you have one here next to, let's say a 10.5, it will be very closer to here uh, which is the global minima. So this is what you try to find. So you have all those different agents um, working together and telling you that, oh, the one that is at 10.5 is the one that is actually uh, at the best performance. So this is basically how it will actually work and how it will go on and update itself in general. Uh, so where it will go on and say, okay, so that was the best one. So let me find a way to calculate some vector and move this closer to, 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 to the, where the sweet spot is. Um, it does that in the second iteration. And then this one also as well realizes that, oh, okay, so I'm no longer in the best position. This one is now in the best position. So let me move myself closer to this one. And then they both move closer to the sweet spot. And as, as you can see here, the search space is actually decreased because they have, they're actually moving towards each other. So um, before we even go on to talk about the Olympics and optimization algorithm, it's very important to talk about the fact that there's many other algorithms that were bio-inspired. Uh, we have genetic algorithms which follow how genes uh, um, mutate and do the crossover and, uh, um, and uh, uh, within themselves, so basically the inversions uh, uh, which happens within the gene in the real life, the survival of the, fit of the fetus. Um, so we actually went, they actually went on and decoded that into, into making an optimization algorithm, which is then called um, genetic optimization. Um, here, for example, there's another one called the ant colony, um, or, uh, which then looks at how the ants leave the pheromones. So these red dots here indicating the pheromones, and then these red ones here indicating the strength of the pheromones. So when the, fer when the ants leave the pheromone, they actually indicate uh, um, if the pheromone smells stronger, it tells the other agents that, oh, the food is closer to this one, to this spot here, so you must move closer to here. And it is said that whenever there's danger scents, uh, they actually leave a certain different kind of scent of the pheromones so that it can tell that, you can uh, let the other ones know that they must not go to this side because there's danger, even though the food is closer. So they have different ways in which they communicate with each other. 
Um, then there's another one here called the moth flame optimization. So a moth generally wants to fly towards the moon, uh, but because today we have so many artificial lights, the moth ends up now being confused because now it needs to fly to the moon, but it's also flying towards this light, which is here, the artificial light, which is closer by. And in the, as a result, it ends up circulating and converging towards this light. So this algorithm is very interesting because this is actually an optimal algorithm by, uh, um, uh, um, by an era of intelligence. Um, and since here yeah, we're talking with the with the engineering with the engineering uh, uh, guys, and I'm sure that there's some guys here from uh, the material science background, so they might be able to appreciate this one. So this is another algorithm called the simulated annealing algorithm, which works the same way that you do the annealing of the material of of the metals, where you overheat the material and then you let it cool down at a certain temperature, and then this algorithm actually tries to do that to find out which temperature is the best one and how which position will actually give us the best temperature and tries to optimize in that manner. So that's given all that, that also inspired us to say, um, we have noted when you're looking at uh, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu philosophy that it, it is very, it, it, is, it is an optimal, it is an optimal philosophy. Uh, and also it looks, at, it looks after the community because what we realized then was that, um, in most of those algorithms that we showed you, most of them, what they realize, what they look at is they look at the individual themselves. They don't look at the community. They don't look at whether the community is benefiting or not. And then we say that, um, but in real life, in most cases, what you need is you need a situation where when one is rising up, you need everyone to rise up. And then when we observe, we observe that um, there are situations in within our ways when we're growing up where uh, we had processes which uh, uh, in Chivenda, we call it Ulimisana, and then in, in Sutu, they call it the Tima, where one family goes to, 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 to plow their, their, their field, uh, and then they invite the other families to come help them. So we all plow in that field, and then we, next we move to the other family, we help out the other family, and then next we move to the other family, we help the other family, until the whole area is covered. And that is how this uh, um, agents, uh, uh, this is how this algorithm is actually going to work. Um, so in this algorithm, what we have is that we then have families uh, where each and every agent which we have within our, our community belongs to these different families. Um, and when they belong to a different family, these different families have trust elements, uh, uh, trust levels to each other, uh, which then indicate these four values of Ubuntu that we talked about here. And we actually go on and model uh, these four, uh, four uh, values of Ubuntu. So one way in which you can go think about this process of Ulimisana today in a way that will make sense in a modern sense is to think of the stock fans. Um, and also those of you who know uh, politics and, and political economics, uh, you know that in, in Tanzania, they had a process called Ujama. It's a similar, it's a similar process. It follows the same thing. And in Kenya, they call it Harabe. It follows a similar process. So uh, what we then did was for this algorithm to work, uh, it needs to have um, an incentive algorithm, an incentive incentive mechanism. So we call this incentive the Ubuntu incentive scheme or Ubuntu incentive mechanism, where basically an individual gains um, uh, uh, their their own uh, their own their own pay uh, um, uh, payoff or their own uh, uh, objective value. So basically, the reward. And then we said um, any individual who is be between this particular age, we call them a provider because they are still at the age where they can provide. And anyone outside that boundary um, is a dependent because they're in an age which they cannot, they're still dependent on their parents or, 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 care, or caregivers within the community. So then we say, okay, so here we're going to calculate everyone who's a, pro who's a provider and everyone's a dependent. But then what we do is that we use this one to then determine um, for the family, family payoff, how much are they getting from uh, 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 from this society? Because what we then need, you don't want a situation where this family gets given much uh, um, much money, uh, much reward when so many people who are dependent are actually being poor. Uh, they're not being they're not being uh, well well taken care of. So this one here updates it in that particular manner to say we we. Uh, um, uh, these coefficients multiply on how much each person is supposed, each each group is supposed to contribute to the bigger scheme of things. Um, then you then after you do that, you then say 
uh, for each family, we need to find out how much each family uh, uh, is, um, how much each family is worth. And then what we have is we have a minimum, the bare minimum within, uh, which is accepted for each family. Uh, you can think of it as the the World Bank, uh, um, uh, uh, the World Bank uh, uh, poverty line. So if the family is below that poverty line, then we call it poor. If it's up above it, then we say it's wealthy. And then we use that to determine the wealthy of the whole community. So after that, we then say, um, but we need to find out which, if this community managed to get this now in this particular instance, how much, how much difference it is from, when, from the last time that uh, we dealt with this community. If the, if the difference is negative, we know that when now we come update the families, uh, each family's uh, um, uh, um, uh, reward, it's going to be affected negatively. And then when we look at this family and if get, getting affected negatively, we'll then go on and look and say, oh, okay, so, the, but we're now going back to, to, to give the, the rewards back to an individual. And then when we come back to the individual as well, uh, since the, the, the community was negative and the family was negative, the individual's payoff will now become negative. And this is what in Ubuntu they say, uh, when one bleeds, the whole community bleeds. When one succeeds, the whole community succeeds. Because if this was a positive, then if this one will also be, also be a positive, and then this one will also be a positive. So it's a, very, it's a recursive uh, um, incentive scheme. So we then also have the trustworthiness, and then the trustworthiness, how it works is that um, each family then looks and say, okay, so I have my own, uh, so we are families here, um, but then let's look at the ratings that each we give to the other to the other families out there in uh, um, uh, that we interact with, and then from those ratings, that that's where now we build the reputation that each family will have, and then from that reputation, I go on and say, but wait, wait a minute, I need to know if I trust my neighbor, those who are called to be my friends, those are who I say that they are my advisors. I need to know if um, through them I can be able to trust the other families, and then we use this. Uh, uh, equation to try to determine that, um, and then it actually informs us whether I should be able to trust the next person or not to trust the next per the, the next person, and to what value of uh, trust this person to. Uh, so the value ranges from zero to one. Where if it's one, it means that I trust this person very into uh, 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 very very fully, and if it's zero, it means that I don't trust this person. So this year, uh, being the reputation that is there out there in the public, and this one being my own privately held reputation. So if this uh, omega value is is uh, uh, is big, it means that I trust my value more. And if it's like this, then it means that I try. If 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 it's low, smaller, it means that I trust the, the my advisors more than I trust myself because most probably because I've not dealt with these people before. So then we use that to update the positions that I I am within my community. Uh, where our coefficients are calculated according to these equations here, which we will not go on to explain, but these equations are based on uh, the trust and the social network trust that we have within our community. Um, and one thing to note here is that if you looked at the, the previous ones that we showed you for the other algorithms, they only had the local best and the global best. Whereas now in our situation, we went on and say, no, that's looking, that can, that, it's not enough. So I must have the local best, and I must have the best within my family, because within my family, I have family members as well. So I need to know within my family members, who was the best one, who performed the best. So we call that the global best, uh, the local best. And then we also go on and say, but um, from this particular time here, there was a family that most probably was, uh, the, which, which performed uh, the best. Let's find out which, which family that was. And then when we find out what family that was, we then go on and say, let us find out who's that person in that family that performed the best, because we want that person's position. Um, when it comes to this one here, the local best for the community, we say, we know that there was a time when the community was at its best. When was that particular time, this T star for the community? And when this T star for the community, which family was actually at the best of their performance around that time? Once we find out which family was at the best around that time, let us find out who in the, that family was the best, uh, who was the best individual. And then we use that to update these terms here. Um, so this year indicates how the, the, the pseudocode of uh, the, uh, our algorithm that we developed um, 
it follows the same process as I indicated uh, um, even be, uh, as indicated before, so I won't go into much details explain it. I will just go straight into the results. So just to show the results, uh, um, uh, for example, I'll, I'll just maybe start with um, uh, I'll try to get uh, I want to play a, a simulation from from this. So basically what you're seeing here is, is trying to solve the another function, which is called the bell function. Um, so what it then does is, is it tries to move around to say, if I were to solve this problem, how do I then move around to, to, to solve, to solve uh, uh, the challenge that I'm faced with? And then if we were to look at now how it tries to solve uh, the... And how it tries to solve the pen holder, the pen holder function. Uh, so the pen holder function is actually even an interesting one because it has four different solutions in it. It has a solution uh, uh, here, a solution here, a solution here, and a solution here. But this algorithm is able to find in different occasions all these different the different solutions here. So in this particular uh, uh, situation here, it's finding it's moving towards this one. So what you also note with the algorithm that we developed was that. Um, there was a way in which we can control um, uh, the updating of the terms uh, by using the different uh, uh, sigmoid functions, which we call them the transformer functions, on how to go towards the solution. And then we compared the different results and how the convergence rate for each and every single one of them actually works. And if you can see here, for example, you'll see that these two ones that are up here, this is when you're using the convergence rate, which is, is, which is very linear. Um, when for this particular uh, uh, for this particular fu function that test function best function that we're using here, so when, because of we're using that one the linear ones, it's very slow into converging. But when you're using the the, ta the tangent one, which is follows the segment uh, uh, S curve, it becomes very uh, uh, very fast into the convergence and also becomes very uh, uh, crisp and clear in that in in how it actually converges towards the solution. Uh, and that also depends on the different applications that you're working on, because in certain applications you want, you, if your safe space is too big, you want your your your, your solution to be able to have uh, a much flexibility in terms of exploration. And uh, uh, and in some situations when you have too many um, uh, optimal positions next to each other, you want to give your your sol your solutions enough space to do exploitation of the solution. Um, sorry, please give me a second. Yeah. Let me just do this. I don't know what the issue is here. Yeah? I'm not. Uh, can you please assist me here? I don't know what's happening with the presentation. Um, is it stuck? Is it not moving? Next yeah. Slide. Okay. Um, so what I'll do, I'll just give you again the present rights.
Can we retry it? Yeah, let me try now. I don't know why it seems to be stuck. Okay. Just okay, have it on presenter mode. Just have it on presenter mode um, when I give you control. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so one of the applications that one of the things that we went to try to to look at again was uh, the effects of the uh, the trust threshold. So what happens when we move the when we move the trust uh, threshold around to uh, the algorithm? How then does it perform? How well or poorly does it perform? Um, and then one thing that we noted as well was that uh, which was also uh, very much aligned to the to the to our hypothesis and also according to some of the proverbs because we we use a lot of proverbs to verify uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the robustness of uh, uh, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu philosophy in terms of optimization. So one thing that we noted was that when, when you have uh, uh, very low uh, trust values, um, your algorithm then that does not converge. Um, so this year, um, it's similar to another Shona proverb that says, he who is yours will bite your ears. So basically what this person here was doing was that he was saying, uh, I trust everyone. So everyone then started lying to this person, not giving them the uh, proper advice. And then this is why they were actually, they actually end up diverging. Whereas these other ones here have a very strong uh, level of trust. And that is why they are able to converge in a, in a, in a, in a much uh, uh, reliable manner. Uh, so, and then also another thing here was that we also said like we can actually be able to visualize how the convergence actually occur when we're looking at uh, the mean of the different individuals within each family. Um, so one of the things that we have done as well now, uh, one of the papers that we have, which we are uh, uh, submitting now is how we're using this algorithm to fine tune the hyperparameters uh, of the neural network. In a in a, a way which they call the population-based uh, uh, training, um, which was developed by Google, and we found that in our approach, our approach is actually even um, uh, outperforming the classical Bayesian optimization algorithm. Uh, and then we also went on and uh, implemented um, uh, that same population-based training algorithm on the particle swarm optimization. Uh, Tolani, over to you. Hi, thanks. Uh, so thank you guys. Thanks Joshua very much for that. Um, I think you can start sending your questions through and then we have Joshua um, attempt to answer them. Um, if we can't um, answer all your questions, we will. Um, Joshua will be able to start to answer them after the, the webinar and they will be posted um, on the um, on the SAI double E uh, website. Um, I think we might have a question already, Joshua. Let me just uh, try to get it properly. Okay, so we've got a question from Neil. Um, I'm just gonna read it out, Joshua. A uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, the first question, how does uh, the Ubuntu optimization algorithm perform when compared to other algorithms such, such as the genetical, genetic alg algorithm and the uh, particle swarm optimization? Uh, thank you, uh, So we compared it against um, uh, the, the particle swarm optimization, the gray, the gray wolf, uh, the artificial B algorithm, uh, the social spider algorithm. Um, and we found that uh, the, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu algorithm was able to uh, outperform uh, most of those. The only one that it used, it, uh, um, it will get competition from uh, for different applications 
uh, was the uh, was the the PCO the PCO uh, algorithm and the and the gray and the gray wolf. But in general, uh, in most uh, uh, hard uh, um, uh, uh, test bench functions which needed the balance between exploration and exploitation, we actually uh, beat them out, we actually beat them. Right, we've got a comment uh, from Ngeno. Um, I think he's just praising your presentation. Uh, uh, excellent presentation by Joshua. Um, um, any further questions? I think yeah, we just a bit, yeah, we are earlier than the six o'clock time that we had uh, um, anticipated. Um, got a I can't hear you. Um, yeah, there's another question. I'll just give this a second. Well, let's just get it properly. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is a question from uh, Rishit Patel. How will we optimally uh, able to use this algorithm if some input values are, are false? So, I'm not sure if you got that, Joshua. If some, if some what are what? The input values um, are false, or I think I think this has to do with the data integrity, um, which no, no, are no. Been put into the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. So, so the data integrity part uh, is the whole junk in, junk out. So it's always up to the to to, to the designer uh, of the of the of the solution. When you're designing a solution, you need to clean up your data. So there's nothing that an algorithm can magically do if your data integrity is, is bad. All right, thanks, Joshua. Those are the three questions that you currently have. I think I can, um, if, if there's more questions and if maybe there's people who want to give uh, uh, questions by just talking, I think if that's possible, they can, uh, ask questions, uh, I wouldn't mind. Okay, I'll see if I can be able to to enable that. Uh, I'm not sure if you are able to see the questions as well, Joshua, on your side. Um, uh, so this is a follow-up no, no, uh, from Richard. It's a follow-up from Richard. It says, uh, what if someone is forced to input false values under pressure? Uh, that is a problem which they call uh, backdooring or uh, backdooring machine learning. Um, so there is an active research that looks at, into that. Um, uh, uh, that that is part of what um, uh, the the what you call this the the gun the gun algorithms. They look into that. Uh, there's a there's a big there's a big study on adversarial adversarial of uh, machine learning. So that. That that is a that is a part again, which is also related to the question that someone asked about the faulty data. Um, there is nothing, unfortunately, that uh, uh, the algorithm itself can actually do on its own. But it's a research that people are working on. I don't know the direction of the research and what the objectives are, but I know that there's a there's a there's a research active active research in that space as well. All right, thanks. I think uh, uh, Richard is covered there uh, with your answers. Any further questions? If you do want to speak through the mic, um, um, you, you are, yeah, you're welcome to do so. Uh, try to raise your hand and then I will um, unmute you. Right. All right. Um, there's a question there, Joshua, from um, uh, from Spusiso. Uh, we have heard of many algorithms displaying biases with their results. How robust? How robust is the Ubuntu algorithm to avoid or eliminate these? Can you give an example where this was tackled or encountered? So the, you said you has that many algorithms that what? Um, 
algorithms displaying biases within their results. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a very interesting one uh, because um, uh, the, the third paper that we're working on is how we're actually using uh, uh, Ubuntu, uh, the, the, the Ulimisana optimization algorithm to tackle the, the, the biasness. Um, so I will say that let's we can leave that for a talk some other time if needs be. Uh, but we have seen that um, the approach that we, we took to try to tackle that uh, actually came up with better uh, with better results because of the trust element that is there on on our algorithm because our algorithm uses a concept called social trust network. Uh, so we have found some good results in terms of tackling the, the biasness. All right, thanks, Joshua. Um, yeah, that's about it uh, for now in terms of questions. Let's give it a few more minutes and then um, to see if there's any further questions, but other than that, I think we, yeah, we feel that's the time. Hi, Joshua. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thanks, and you? I'm all good. My name is Jeanette Ramakatani, your former colleague. I am Hi, Jeanette, watching... how are you? <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay, and you are uh, just... I am watching just to see what you've been up to, and I just wanted to congratulate you on this other achievement on the AI. It's still jargon, but I am interested. Thanks, thanks a lot. I don't have a question. Um, I just wanted to congratulate ah, you and thanks. Ah, thank you, Jeanette. All right. Thanks, Jeanette, for that. Um, we've got a question uh, from Susisa. Where can one get uh, the paper on your algorithm? Uh, it's it's available on uh, IEEE Access for free. Uh, if you just say introducing or an optimization algorithm based on Ubuntu philosophy. Okay. Do you perhaps have a link uh, ready with you there, Josh? But you can just paste it on the chat uh, our chat tab here. I think that would also assist. Okay. Let me try to do that. Yeah, I'll send it to you, Kolani. I think you might have to send it to to the main chat. Okay, I think yeah. Uh, all right, now I'll do so. Um, all right, I think that's about it in terms of questions. All right. Um, thanks everyone for for attending the webinar. Um. Uh, please do uh, kindly um, uh, visit uh, the SAI website. Um, that's uh, saiwe.org.za uh, for any upcoming webinars um, that we that the chap um, that the, um, um, the organization might have in the upcoming in the near future. And uh, yeah, thanks once again for for attending and uh, participating in the in the webinar. Um, right. uh, Joshua, if you want to say something and then we can close. 
All right, no, thank you. Uh, thank you guys for for your uh, for your participation. Um, it was very it was very good to present in front of you. I hope um, uh, uh, you guys were able to follow me uh, in the presentation, and I hope uh, and I wish you all the guys the best in your uh, in your journey and your in, in, while you go on in the park on uh, on the AI projects within your organizations. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.